Hi everyone and welcome to episode eight of our series of commentaries that we're moving into. So this is really focusing no longer on simply managing the crisis as our first 25 episodes did, did and we're also looking at the new future. In this series, we interview HR and finance leaders who not only have been through the last six month crisis, but have actually generally started to find the benefit and the improvements and positive news and the positive developments and starting to forge a new direction for their businesses. So it's a real exercise in trying to understand what's changing and what we can take from it and what we can all learn from it, HR and finance professionals. So I'm Thomas, founding director of Brand Performance, and um, I've really enjoyed the last, uh, well, 33 um, interviews and conversations we've had with a huge range of businesses and sectors. So this year, we've talked to people from government, from law firms, Norton Rose, Slater and Gordon, retail like Office Shoes and Body Shop, who have both presented with us, charities, including Marie Curie, uh, insurance firms and financial services firms, NS Amlin, Amlin, Charles Stanley, to name a couple, hospitality, healthcare, Channel 4 and broadcasting. And now we are intending to talk about rail and transport, which I think is a sector which is obviously, we all know, has been impacted very significantly. And so I'm uh, really excited to understand more about this. So this morning we have Richard Smith, who has worked at the Department of Transport, Network Rail and First Group and has an extensive knowledge of transport and um, and the delivery and, and the impact actually of COVID on transport. So I'm um, really delighted to welcome Richard this morning. Thanks, Tom. Great to be here. Great. So explain why we at Brand Performance are hosting these webinars. Brand is a consultancy that works um, and helps companies to improve and transform the way which HR and finance works. We work particularly in the sectors of financial services and transport, as well as legal and other sectors, but transport is one of our key um, sectors, so it's very close to our hearts. Um, the, um, and so we, therefore, are really interested in supporting all our clients, customers and friends in um, in the impact of the pandemic and then how that's changing our plans, transform the way we work in the future. So Richard, do you want to introduce yourself and give an overview of how you've seen the rail sector impacted over the last eight months? So I'm really interested yeah. in accelerated what has happened in the rail sector anyway and other characteristics so over to you richard really looking forward to hearing this thanks tom and uh, first of all apologies my my internet seems to have um given up the ghost uh, just before the webinar which is kind of uh, quite typical i think but um so apologies i'm only on voice uh, looks like probably for most of the most of the call so i'm richard smith i'm i've spent my career as a management consultant and then latterly a transformation director the last uh, 10 or 12 years, um, as Tom mentioned, in transport and the transport sector, uh, mainly in uh, surface transport. So um, heavy goods and public service vehicles, rail and um, buses as well. And, um, I, you know, I mean, like like all all sectors, I suppose, um, COVID has a massive impact. It certainly had a, a very significant and detrimental impact on public transport um, around the globe, uh, and not least here in the UK. Um, focusing particularly on rail, I think, um, and we'll probably get onto buses later, I think, Tom, but yeah, I mean, the rail sector, I, I think you probably, as you pointed out in your introduction, it, it, it was a sector, it's, a, it's an extremely political sector. It's a sector that um, gets a lot of press and, and it's an essential public service. Um, and obviously, since since the privatisation in the early nineties, um, it's been it's been controversial for one way or another. I think in the industry, a lot of people would say, and I think I'd agree with this, it's been an extremely successful um, twenty thirty years. Uh, you know, huge growth in the industry, lots more people, lot, much greater ridership, lots of people taking the train. However, I think certainly in the last particularly in the last probably 10 years, um, increasing strains and frustrations from stakeholders in that industry. And, and of course, particularly and not least 
the customers, the passengers, um, and frustrations about how the industry is structured, um, ticketing prices, particularly um, punctuality, the state of the asset, um, and so. Yes, I think it is absolutely fair to say that what, what you've seen in the last uh, few months is an acceleration of change in the rail sector that probably would have happened anyway, but has, has kind of been forced on um, on the government, frankly, and decision makers um, to to do something different that they would probably have liked to have do, done anyway. And, uh, and what are those things? So, um, obviously, the... Um, the collapse in revenues. So, you know, we're talking about something like a 20%, I believe, uh, ridership, if that's the right word, during the early part of the COVID crisis. So revenues collapsed to an enormous extent. And yet, of course, there was a push to continue with the service pretty much at the same level or at least a reasonably recognisable level as before. So those financial pressures, who have they been hitting, and and and, and how have that? How what is it accelerating? As you say, Richard. Yeah, yeah and in fact, it went down to single digits. In fact, in terms of ridership at the, the peak of the lockdown, so um, you know, four or five percent on some days, um, which is incredible when you think about it. Yeah, so that you know that huge collapse in, in revenue, um, and and in, and in terms of the state, I think you know to start with, it is it's very important to remember. Although it's run by, uh, well, operated by um, private companies, this is a public service. And so um, it, it is something that the government could not allow to fail, not least um, back in those days, of course, getting key workers where they needed to be was, was essential. Um, and so it, it, it had to be supported. And so really, in effect, what you've seen is... Um, is a, is a very rapid move to, in effect, concessions. So, as you know, the, 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 um, the operators operate on franchises of varying lengths with varying terms, but broadly speaking, what that means is that the operators bear the revenue risk. Um, now, when they sign those contracts, and that has a checkered history, which we, which we might get into a little bit, but when they sign those contracts, they're certainly not planning for revenues to drop to sort of 3 or 4% per, of what they had been in previous years. And so it, it, it was appropriate for the government to step in. And then in fact, what they've done is put them onto management contracts, which are not really similar to concessions in effect. So kind of emergency measures um, where the revenue risk is borne by the, by the government. And so that is something that has long been um, mooted from the future of the railway. Um, I think you alluded to the Williams Review, which is um, a, a former BA chairman a number of years ago was tasked with reviewing the rail sector um, because of the, the, the political pressures and, and the dissatisfaction across the variety of stakeholders. That review has never been published. There's always um, kind of whispers about what it may contain. But I think you know, the broad thrust of that is that the franchising model that was set up in the 90s does not work. There is, it does not satisfy anyone really i think these days i think private sector operators feel that the balance of, of risk and reward is not satisfactory from the government's perspective they probably argue and they're not getting the the, the level of, of um investment and innovation that they they expect from the customer's perspective albeit there's many more services uh, they're really um you know the 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 standards, the service standards within the trains themselves and the levels of punctuality are, are not where they want to be. Um, what rail has kind of tens of billions of pounds that it needs to spend on, on an aging asset, which becomes increasingly difficult with a busy railway. And so the franchise model, with, which really was, in many ways, it's, it's kind of, it, it's a little bit ironic, I suppose, because it, it constrains um, it's supposed to free up what the operators can do, but in reality, the operators are quite constrained by uh, the other aspects of, of the railway, not least the maintenance and renewals that need to go on um, and the, the assets that break down, um, looking after, you know, small things like looking after stations, etc. So, so really, there's, um, this, this kind of deep satisfaction was, was due to be 
hopefully somewhat um, resolved. It's a very difficult, difficult question through the Williams Review. That's never published. Uh, and I think probably... Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Tom. Poor, uh, poor Mr. Williams. I'm assuming it's a Mr. Poor Mr. Williams, who presumably has... We've all been waiting for this report now for some time, but um, events have rather overtaken um, the... the the, the thoughts he was coming up with, I imagine. So some of the items are going to be demonstrated in full, but I imagine that he did not factor in and has not factored into that report the uh, drop in revenue. I'm really interested in unpacking this, this difference between the franchise model and the um, concession model. So if I understand that, I mean, if I took uh, TFL as an example, the reliance upon revenue which a type of franchise model, although TfL is clearly um, government-owned, but for the other franchisees, they're reliant upon the revenue um, from riders. Then their profit is the difference between that and the cost of running the services. With that revenue collapsing to virtually zero in some weeks over the last few months, presumably the concession model is where they get paid for running the service, Rather than paid for, um, rather than paid by the riders themselves, is that is that kind of a reasonable summary of the situation, Richard? Yeah, that's exactly right. So, in a franchise, um, the, the operator, um, in this case, would pay the department for transport for the for the right, and it would be one of the costs of of that um, of that deal. It would be you know you pay many millions to the department of transport, or commit to paying many millions to the department of transport. Um, to run a franchise, and then you hopefully sell lots of tickets and, and make some money. And in a in a concession, the Department of Transport would pay you to run the railway, and they'd pay you a fee, and you'd do it, um, and you, you'd bid at the point of a uh, point of contract. You'd bid on a certain level of cost, and you'd sort of ex, you know see what you get. So that might be open book um, or not. They might they might not. Um, you, you might do it on a more competitive basis. Um, at the moment, for example, there are, there are um, franchise train operators, uh, sorry, concession, concession train operators in the U- in the UK already. Mersey Rail is the most famous one, um, mm-hmm. and so that that is um, commissioned by the local authority up there via you know having had the rights delegated from the Department for Transport, and they run their full railway. Uh, and I think probably uh, what Williams probably would have ended up in is mixed economy. I think one, one of the criticisms has always been that just this blanket franchising does not work everywhere for every type of railway, but it might work for some, where there's a particular opportunity um, uh, with certain so, so certain revenues, um, certain geographies almost, that it might work. But really, in some areas, a concession is a much more sensible model, many people would argue. Right. So, so the concession, the, the, the kind of blanket application of uh, concession model during the uh, um, crisis, it's kind of like a, a, a furlough for rail services. It yeah. keeps, them, yeah. keeps them alive, supports them, gives them the base amount, um, which allows their, them to um, keep going and being ready. But at the same time, it kind of mothballs the... Um, the, the the provision until such a time as demand is kind of returned to something approaching normal. Exactly right. And, and and if you're unsure, I mean uncertainty is a real is a real problem when you're bidding for a franchise, of course. You know, you, you're looking at these five, seven, ten year deals. And if you're uncertain of what the ridership's going to be, and in fact really that's that's been the a lot of the root of where you you'll have seen in the press where um where franchisees have had to hand back the keys, as the phrase goes, to the Department of Transport and sort of just give up. And that's really been because their, their projections of revenue, i.e. Their, project, their projections of passengers over the term has been inaccurate. And, and sometimes that's because they've just, they, you know, they've looked at GDP and said, well, if GDP goes like this, then we expect passengers will go like this. And then, you know, we'll do some marketing and we've got very clever... Um, ideas around pricing and elasticity and we can think we can move people onto the railway so we think this this and this and if they get those assumptions wrong uh, that's going to cost them a lot of money and a lot of these organizations are publicly owned and so there's a lot of pressure from shareholders um, and, and so that you know and, and then when you look at it as a public good that's when it comes into conflict with the politics and the media. 
Because mm -hmm. there is a third model, I guess, which is neither concession nor franchise, but actually uh, public ownership, which is uh, okay. also, also an option for some of the, uh, the, the, the sector, right? Absolutely, and, and obviously the previous Labour um, administration was, was very keen and want, wanted absolutely to do that, and that was, um, you know, I, I think there's, there's, you know, a personal view on this, I think um, the mixed economy probably works. When you sort of get down to it, there's not a lot of, uh, there's not a lot in it for private companies when it's a concession. It's a kind of, it's a bit of, maybe a bit of a cash cow, you're unlikely to get a lot of growth. Uh, you could see certain organisations may be interested in it, people who contract for, for the government already on low margins, very predictable, uh, predictable income. Uh, but you're not going to get necessarily a lot of innovation there. Uh, there'll probably be some bonus arrangements around customer satisfaction and punctuality. Um, but it becomes it becomes very light uh, nationalised railway i would argue albeit you just kind of you know you're just contracting it out and i think initially when where you know back in the 90s the idea was you bring a lot of uh, private sector innovation investment into the sector and there is a risk that you you'll lose that with a with a with more concessions mm -hmm. yes uh, I, I i can see that i can see that so um in coming out of the the crisis. I mean, what what sort of levels are we talking about now, and how much wriggle room does it do to return some to a kind of franchise model? I mean, are any of the um, rail services in the UK anywhere near the capacity they were pre um, pre the crisis, or is it still vastly down everywhere? I mean, it's still hugely down. Um, on, on average, it's, it's down to about 50%, um, which is perhaps better than people had, had, had hoped. Um, it, it's interesting. I mean, I, I'm based in London. You get sometimes get a bit of a London-centric view. And if I go up to my, um, my local station uh, at 8, eight o'clock in the morning when you used to be literally sort of forcing yourself onto a train and now it seems almost empty, it's hard to imagine that, that it's even at 50% across the country but you know a lot a lot of um in a lot of places there, there really isn't an option um other than the ra other than the railway um I, there's only about a quarter of the country i was reading the other day that really can work from home so you've still got a lot of people um you know who don't have don't have private vehicles and we don't really want them taking private vehicles frankly as a country of course from an environment perspective and so so i think the ridership will will come back to certain levels but i think from a a London perspective, which, which is, by the way, from the economics of the railway, is what pays for a lot of the railway around the country. So London commuter railways make money, and most of the others don't. They're much more heavily subsidised. And I think there, in a, there, there will be a problem because you, you, if that's a lot of professional people, um, probably who can work from home, um, whereas um, the uh, out in the regions, perhaps, arguably, the, the balance of uh, manufacturing sector versus tertiary sector is different, and people will still need to get on the railways. So, uh, you know, it's a very big, complex puzzle around the economics of this. I mean, and then one thing, just, just on that regional perspective, I think one thing that is interesting or might be interesting for the future is more devolved control of the railway, mm -hmm. particularly where there's some. Um, sort of geographical sense to that. I, I mean, I think, you know, if you, if you took um, a, a big intercity railway like GWR coming out of Paddington down through Swindon, Bristol, Exeter, Cornwall, you know, it's very difficult to control that locally as such. But I think, you know, Mersey Rail is a good example. Perhaps something like Trans Pennine, Northern Rail, you could see some of the mayors getting together and saying, look, we, were, we, want, we want to set the requirements for this railway because we understand things better locally what we need i think that is an interesting point i think it allies to some of the some of the um, conversations that were happening in manchester around the lockdown and burnham um, putting himself you know you know in, in the line of fire there and setting out his store for, the, for what they want locally and tfl have, have, uh, for a long time has talked about some of the lines that are basically they're not quite within the m25 but 
a lot of these looping lines that are really suburban lines, TfL would like to specify the requirements for those um, and, and take more control of those. So I think that might be something we'll see in the future. That's very interesting, the idea of more uh, local control. I mean, we've seen it in, you know, um, rail has been um, specifically um, a centralised activity and an and, and exercise in centralisation for quite a long time. There's been some push towards regionalisation, but I suppose as one moves more from a franchise to a concession model, and, and if what that's seen as long term, then actually... The, the, the stakeholders in it, the people who are paying for it, are more local, and they should have more say in uh, in the way it works, and, and, and possibly have have a greater um, uh, greater ability to drive those to 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 achieve local needs in a way in which uh, central, you know, one size fits all is much harder to um, to um, to uh, push at this point when actually things are different in different regions in the country. We have, you know, we have regions of the UK who are behaving and in lockdown in a very different way from others. And that looks like something which is going to continue for a time. And, 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 and therefore, actually, it's all about localism in, in a number of ways. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think it, it's got, it sort of feels like it's going that way somewhat, doesn't it? And um the railway is just such a it's odd isn't it because of that fixed asset <clears throat> excuse me i think the, the political legitimacy of that uh, rests on um on an important on an important balance between in terms of who's paying for it because there's the sort of there's, at the center of the economics of the railway is who pays for it is it the people that ride on it i.e is it ticket prices or is it uh, or, or what is the balance of that with a with a subsidy from the general taxpayer? Now, as a public good, I think most people argue, well, there, there should, of course, be some subsidy. Even if I don't ever use the train, at some point I might. I also want fewer cars on the road, so it sort of makes sense. The, the problem, I think, in the future for some of this local um, local control, as I mentioned, is that you know Manchester. Let's say let's say you know, the north, the northwest, where I'm from, uh, it's um, it's a loss making railway. So it needs to be funded and there'll probably need to be a grant in some aspects. And so you're always going to have this kind of sense, some sort of central influence. I think you're right. I think it should be more devolved. But we do need to remember that you're not going to put ticket prices up such that the Northwest can pay or even your local tax in the Northwest, if you like. You're going to put it up so high that it can actually afford this railway. And so there does need to be some sort of um, grant from central government, I would argue, in the future. But you're describing a situation where, you, where you're basically, we can't afford to have it and we can't afford to not have it either. Yeah, you can afford to have it at a national level. I think it's just, if you, if you try to, um, it's a bit like um, Hammersmith Bridge near where I am. You know, that's, a, that's a, an, an important strategic asset and it should never have been owned by the local councils. Now you've got kind of, TfL saying that, well, they're not going to pay for it and you have to get central government involved. And it's a bit like what's happened with TfL um, here with, um, with, with Khan, Mayor Khan and, um, and the government, you know, so saying, well, you know, you can't afford it now. So we're going to have to bail you out. And, you know, as a national government, you can afford to do that. As a mayor, you can't. As a local council, you can't. So there has to be some underwriting and it is a Victorian asset in most places. And, um, and I think, you know, that's, it's still a sensible deal to do and it's a sensible thing to do, but you need the political will in the centre to give away that control. And, and frankly, you need the, the local leadership to then accept that responsibility and not, you know, so you can see how if that was a different administrations, different parties, how you could see some strains in there. However, I mean, I, I would agree personally, I think that, that is a, a sensible way to go in some areas. Now, um I think that's right. I mean, a lot of my commentators, uh, particularly those who are um, working in office-based organisations, so legal sector, financial services, etc., are talking about and are creating long-term plans to reduce their office leader um, usership um, very significantly. So, um, you know, some of the benefits they're talking about are the fact that people are working from home is generating productivity and contentment improvements in their businesses, which are leading them to plan to reduce the office usage by kind of 
60 uh, percent kind of thing so they're, they're envisaging a future in which people go in possibly to the office maybe two days a week or something like that even after the um the, the pandemic is complete etc so it's a, it's a kind of shift in how people work obviously that is also a huge long-term shift in the demand for um for public transport and also a differential so um, if I am a lawyer going in five days a week from a commuter spot, I pay, I don't know, let's say my season ticket's 3000 And then in the future, if I'm going in two days a week, then um, I, I might buy my ticket separately and then the revenue reduces. Or is it that because I'm going in at certain times and going in to work, that actually it remains 3,000, but I only get two uses a week, if you see what I mean. It's a very, it's yeah. a very complicated model, I, I am guessing. But, the, um, but from all the other commentators from the other industries are telling me that the demand is permanently down and will remain. Down. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, I mean, uh, I mean, I've made a couple of points on that. I, um, I, think, I think that's right. I think it's, it's still um, a, a, a minority. I mean, it's a large minority of people who can work from home. And we, we, almost, we only talk to each other, don't we? So you, you sort of forget about the, the huge armies of people who can't work from home. You probably never yes. see them in our bubble. Um, so, yeah, but but I, I think that's right. I mean, I, think, I still think personally, um, talking to, to, to sort of friends and colleagues and, you know, the, the parents at school, I, people still want to go to the office. Um, and I agree that it want, they want it on their terms and they want it to be less than it was probably. But I, still, I, still, I think maybe the fortunes of the uh, commercial landowners in the centre, property owners in the centre, is probably not quite as woeful as it, as it might have seemed in May. However, your point still stands. And um, yeah, the topic of ticketing is a hugely controversial one. It's another one that Williams was um, due to tackle. It's extremely complex. Um, it's, uh, the, the ticket prices are, are high. Of that is the perception of most most passengers. Um, it's um, the, the, that you could tangent up there to kind of well, what's the balance between passengers and, and general taxation again? I think more more, more importantly, there needs to be a, a simplification. I think responding responding to the COVID challenge and you know season people not needing to travel five days a week. Is a, is a relatively easy one in that that you just need to offer different uh, products. So you you um, you offer a three day a week season ticket, and you can choose when you go, and it doesn't matter. And it's you know it, it's you got to price that well. Um, but yeah, I mean ultimately that means that means a drop in revenue. That might mean taking services out, so there aren't quite as frequent services. Is, is a way to respond to that if the if the levels are. are you know, do drop and stay low, or stay significantly lower. Um, the ticketing in, you know, I think w what I expect to see in the industry is a, is a harmonization of ticketing, getting away from these kind of silly little tricks where you have to buy five tickets to get the cheapest price. That, that pleases nobody. Um, I think you see more centralization of this and, and um, just just, uh, just making it easier for the customer, I think. Um, it's so complex. And as someone who works in the industry, even I'm daunted by, you know, I, I'm worried that I'm not getting best value whenever I buy a rail ticket. And, and that's just not a place for any industry to be in. No, no. Yes, yeah, there's always that... Um that uh, there's, there's a lack of connection between the cost and uh, um, value, I think, in, in rail tickets. It's always, you know, you go there, you charge for £100 and you think that should have been £50 or £20 or whatever. Yeah. But there's no connection. Just, between, uh, yeah. uh, sorry, George, just one, one other thought on that is around competition, which we haven't really talked about. You know, in the moment with the franchise model, um, the competition is at the point of contract um, or just prior to that concessions you'd have the same thing i actually would really like to see some competition in terms of um on the same line um so you so there's a there's a phrase called open access um and there's, there's um a small number of open access operators that are allowed to run their own trains on lines that have basically already been let out to fran to um to franchises and they provide some competition so the one i'm aware of is this whole trains which goes out of um King's Cross, I think. Well, yeah, King's Cross uh, up to Hull. 
and mm-hmm. stops, I think, in um, Doncaster, someone like that. And um, that provides some competition to the East Coast Railway um, because they really have to look at how they price their tickets because there's another option. And that's what you don't have on a lot of routes. Um, and, I, and I think that, that's kind of what I'd like to see, a more open access operation or, or, or even eventually a model where on some of those competitive, like the um, London Northwest, so the one that goes up kind of via crew in that way, Birmingham crew, I'd really like to see competition on that line. Um, and so then you really would see some some value from the pricing, I think. Yes, yeah, very interesting. I mean, all of this has a, 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 a moving on to the kind of people impact of this stuff. But uh, you know, our our teams, colleagues, and our friends who work in transport, this must have been an incredibly difficult period. The last six months. Yeah, yeah, it is, and then it's um, you know a lot of these people are frontline workers, and and it's it's worth remembering that because you know you can't. You can't drive your bus or, or, or your or you know be a guard on a railway from home, and so yes, it has. I think there's um, you know, and there's been some great there's been some great recognition of that. Um, but I think you know, bigger picture with with the with the people who work. Uh, let's stick with the railway. Is um, you know, like I say, you know, I, I, you get a lot of people who are lifers in the railway. They they work on the railway because they love it. Um, and every five, seven years, they get a sort of different coloured uniform. Uh, and because of the way the, the economics work on, on franchising, you know, there's a big hurrah at the start. And then almost inevitably, by towards the end of a franchise, levels of investment drop. And that's not just that, you know, that includes levels of investment in, in the human capital, um, so to speak. So I think, again, this is another thing that um, you'll see... In the rail sector, I think the government recognised this. The rail delivery group, which is the kind of you know the, the cross industry interest group, um, recognised we need to do something around uh, the people aspect and how do you engage uh, engage particularly the frontline staff, the um, not so much the drivers actually, but, but the drivers, but also the the onboard staff, really engage them around customer service. Um, and re-energize that because I think there is, a, you know, you look at some of the customer satisfa- uh, passenger satisfaction scores, you know, they're not great. You do have a lot of people who really, you know, working or really engaged, right? I, you know, I do have a personal fear that that, 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 that might be sort of dropping off somewhat. Um, mm-hmm. So I think that's, a, that's an area where I would expect to see um, wh- whatever we, whatever models we do come out of this pandemic with, um, and I'm not sure what the answer is, but a better engagement. Uh, interesting how powerful the unions still are in railway, whereas not so much in other industries. Uh, and I think, you know, part of that might be a fact, you know, probably a strong part of that is post privatization, maybe how employees have, have, have experienced that, I think is, um, is, is a challenge to the industry. Right. So, so the. On top of the aspects of the um, demand changes, the model changes, the franchise changes, all of this has an impact on team members and staff members and maintaining their engagement in a in a sector in which most of them are correctly enthusiastic and 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 really you know love the service they're providing. Mm. That's something which you see as an area which needs careful attention as we come out of the crisis. By the same way, Richard. Yeah, yeah, I do. And um, I mean, there's also, you know, there's also longer term uh, impacts as well. It, you know, uh, th- eventually you would expect technology on some of these trains to allow driverless trains. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have bits and pieces of that, obviously, in, in, in Docklands, for example. Um, you know, what does that mean for uh, for this industry from a people perspective? Um, uh, how is that? We know how emotive. We know how emotive that topic can be, or is, yeah, yeah, for for for, for passengers as well as uh, as well as employees. I think you know, how, how do you, how, it's probably an, what an inevitability, isn't it? But um, you know, this, it's sort of disruption that that we had on Southwest trains um, through just trying to to, to I say just, but I mean, it, you know, some semi significant change around the guard role, the onboard role. And you know, huge um, industrial action there, and and that is a sector for for the for the rail industry 
going forward if they if we don't get good engagement with the employees and good engagement reset the engagement with the unions as well i think mm, mm, mm. yes I, I imagine it's a real matter of because irrespective of anything else the level of um change which is coming towards the rail and transport sector is clearly there are very significant changes which to occur and they're going to be occurring at pace. Um, yeah. The level of pressure on um, staff members, colleagues, etc., during the last six months has been high and does not look like it's going to reduce, particularly with that burden of change coming uh, th this way. So actually, um, it, it, it's a sector where um, maintaining people's engagement, maintaining the union's engagement, maintaining the thing is going to be quite, it's going to be really tricky, I think, over over the next kind of period because you know we've all been working a little bit on people's goodwill not to not to a huge extent but our goodwill has been high so we, when we we're asked to do things like lockdown and stuff like that yeah. generally our goodwill in the early stages was enormous and it and, and, and is less so now more resistance to this kind of thing and then and then to then be saying as well as everything else as well as the crisis which you have correctly and 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 brilliantly got us through now we've got this other fear of change that's an awful lot of wear on people from an hr perspective that's a, that's a big demand on people's goodwill and their energy yeah i think that's absolutely right and you know yeah and and there's a there's something of a, of a debt isn't there a moral debt um in, in some of this i think as well um I think it'd be, you know, I mean, I don't know. It'd be very interesting to take the temperature at what some of those, um, some of those, you know, gate line people, people on the on the train, are really thinking at the moment. Um, you, you know, uh, many, perhaps also in many ways, you know, do, do they really, do they, do they perhaps care? I think as long as there's, uh, you know, appropriate um, compensation and, and, and an engagement with them, um, as long as they feel empowered. But it's that sort of stuff I think we probably need to really check. And I think the industry is, is starting to recognize that rail delivery group. I expect to see, you know, to, to really be trying to push on some of that in the, in the, in the coming years. Well, it is very interesting, isn't it? I mean, you know, what most people in most industries really hate is having things done to them without rhyme or reason and without warning. So it's kind of clarity, clarity of objectives, clarity of the challenges, sharing those challenges. You mentioned earlier the idea of more regional involvement, and obviously there is significant staff involvement in this decision-making through the, the union membership and stuff like that. But um, but it it always seems a bit like a tension in the um, in the transport industry between those various parties, and actually some way of you know this this is a problem which is industry wide. This is a problem which is specific. This is a problem which is ongoing, and um, and it does involve engaging all these different parties to come up with the right solution. I think. Yeah, I think you're right, and, and it's funny, isn't it? Because I think with something like railway you've got a bit of a head start because, you know, that value proposition is, is kind of quite obvious in a sense when you boil it down. You go, you've got these, you know, these, these uh, amazing feats of engineering, these huge heritage names, you know, that, that, that stand for something. And, 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 you know, what you're delivering is very kind of tangible. And so it's not quite tangible, but you're, you know, you're getting people where they need to be. Um, so, so you've got to, you know, you don't have to do a lot of workshopping to kind of figure that stuff out. It's, it's sort of there. People, People like to be on the Great Western Railway. You know, that's, it's, a, it's a great thing. They're on these huge, huge vehicles. People have wanted to do it since they were since they were kids. So it's um, yeah. I think it, it'd be a shame to to miss that opportunity and really push some of that. Yes, and recognition. I think as well. I mean, the, the um, during the crisis, the uh, the trans transport has kept running throughout the UK and rather mm. brilliantly. That has involved people doing things which uh, is putting them on the front line, putting them in danger, putting them in conflicted positions on a regular basis as well. You know, wear your mask. Uh, I don't want to wear my mask, all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. which we, we hear about. And, uh, and recognition of the continuity of service during that period and quality of service which is being provided is something which I think is very important. 
um, going forward because it is, you know, it, it, it is remarkable that uh, services have been running in the way they have been running. And I know it's a joint effort of multiple parties, but, um, but you know, we should be um, recognising and celebrating the industry for doing that, for, for keeping things going in that way. We've seen, we've seen other uh, industries. Uh, Sorry, go on. Yeah. No, I would just say I, I, I 100% agree with that. And, and maybe just a word as well on buses, um, because um, they've kept running as well, of course. And, um, you know, it's the sort of least glamorous end of transport, isn't it, I suppose. And, um, you know, having been involved in some in some of that world, uh, you know, to get through that the, the, the pandemic and the lockdown and, the, you know, just the you know, from, from obviously the frontline staff, but also... You know, imagine what it takes to manage that. Um, because, of course, it's not just the bus drivers. Those buses all still need maintaining. They need fueling. Um, some of those depots are not, you know, not lovely places to be. And um, I think just that. And, and in fact, if you remember, of course, at the start of the pandemic, was concerned that bus drivers in particular were, were, were more, more likely than others to be catching the, the, uh, the disease. So, you know, there's a, there's a huge... Um, I think you're right. That, that kind of recognition around the buses, much like you know, much like in the, you know, it's not, it's not glamorous to say, but Sainsbury's kept open as well. You know, there were people stacking shelves uh, who went in and did that work. So I think you know, there's, there's a huge. Um, there does need to be a kind of recognition of that. Yes, and a, hu a huge debt, really. Well, that was fascinating, mm. Richard. Thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Um, I thought that was. Absolutely fascinating. I mean, I suppose it's characterised by a, an area in particular, which is awaiting clarity of direction. And the delay of the Williams report, and presumably the need to kind of rewrite it substantively, the lack of clarity about what the future demand is, need for immediate support, makes it an area and an industry which is under particular pressure and particular difficulties in trying to map their way out of out of this crisis and into the new world but uh um let's you know it, it really sounds like there's some really exciting tools and ideas there and um i love talking to you and talking about that sector so thank you very much richard for joining tom, us today. tom can i feed in some questions please yes, please yes so um, we've got a question from Lucy um, that came in about 20 minutes ago, and this was about HS2. So she yeah. said, how do you see these changes affecting HS2? Is it too late to turn back on the project? Is the value still perceived as the same as working environments change? And this is really interesting because I heard on a podcast the other day about the canals and how by the time we'd finished building the canals, they were no longer needed because I think rail had been invented. Um, and I guess there's a bit of that feel, isn't there? By the time HS2 is finished, you know, is it still going to be needed? What, what are your thoughts on that, Richard? Oh, has that ship sailed to mix the metaphors? Um, yeah, yeah, I think um, I believe, I, I believe um, this government is committed to it. I think it will it will happen. Um, HS2, uh, is, you probably know, actually, it's kind of misnomer. It's, it's about capacity. It's not really about speed. And there's been a, um, a real marketing issue pr issue with that i think which is a shame um i don't know i mean I, I i probably would have said a couple of three years ago are there are there are there cheaper ways to get that capacity onto the railway uh, and with with the pandemic does it mean that we we need less capacity i i think probably not on the latter point um i i think uh, people are still going to want to travel um as a country, we need them off the roads, frankly. We don't want them in private vehicles because that's hugely polluting. So we, we still are going to need that uh, that artery between London and the north. Um, I think it's, you know, it is hugely expensive. It is a shame the way that these things always get budgeted and then end up doubling and doubling again. Um, the business case is very much on a kind of economic benefit perspective, which, in, which I would say, you know, they never stack up. The Channel Tunnel would never stack up. Someone's always going to go bust. Uh, but then, you know, but then ultimately in 10 years' time, when you look at the Channel Tunnel now, it's, sort of, it's just there, isn't it? And we use it and it's a, it's a good thing and we're glad we did it. Um, I, I feel like eventually that will be the case of HS2. I, I do think it's a shame how, it, how we've gone about it. I don't think we've gone about it in a very clever way, put it that way. 
I want to ask another one as well from Philomena, which is around the current logistics industry. So she says, hello, I'm wondering on your perception of the current logistics industry in the UK now, the strains, challenges and successes. Yeah, logistics is interesting. Um, it, it, well, in general, I mean, it's, it's a very it's a very large topic. Um, you know, I, I think that probably one of the most interesting bits uh, maybe just to focus on for a second is the is is the last mile stuff. Um, a lot of vehicles on the road, a lot of pollution, ex- you know, more congestion. Just you know, the way we're living now, um, ordering things online, things getting delivered. Um, you know, it's a huge growth area. I think it is. We we really need to think about the sustainability challenge of some of that. Um, the I mean, on the, in terms of railway. It's still very important. We never really talk about freight on the railway, and we, we haven't today, Tom. Um, but uh, rail freight is, is very important logistically. It's, gonna, it, it's very interesting. Sort of, I'm a bit conflicted about rail freight because it you know, takes up so much capacity on the railway. Um, and as a passenger, that's frustrating. Um, it also is very heavy, and it damages the rails a lot. And you know, there's an argument about whether it really pays its way, which I think is an interesting one. Um, but it's um, it's much more environmentally friendly than sticking loads of stuff in lorries. Um, so uh, logistics, I think, is is a, a, you know increasingly important. I think it's an industry that needs a, a sort of strategic reset uh, and, a, and a real think about what we, what we're going to need in the future and how that how that dovetails with other national priorities. Brilliant, thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Where's Beeching when you need him? It sounds like we need someone else thinking about it in the way he did in the uh, 80s, but perhaps not with the same results. Anyway, great to speak to everybody. Thank you all for joining. Richard, thank you again. And thank you, everyone, for taking time out of your day. We'll be doing another event in a couple of weeks' time. um, And we'll be sending out details of who's going to join us and what industry sector we'll be talking to then. So thank you again, Richard. Thank you, everyone, for attending and taking time out. And um, see you all soon.